God gave gifts to men. All of us have been given gifts, spiritual gifts, natural gifts. But so many of us, we don't operate in those gifts because we don't, number one, know we have them. And number two, they're just, we just, no one's ever told us we have them. A spiritual gift is not a gift like if you can play and sing, that's a natural gift. The spiritual gift is a gift you don't choose. I mean, there are people who can, like my daughter, Sarah, she, she can pick up, she went downstairs, I can talk about her. She can pick up a guitar and the next thing is she's picking and then she's playing the bass. I mean, some people can do that. I can't do that. Uh, some people have natural giftings and that's natural, but spiritual gifts are supernatural in origin. So I want to talk to you about that today. And it begins with Ephesians chapter four, verse seven. Holy Spirit, we ask you today to lead us, open our hearts and our minds to the word of God. Teach us what you'd have us to know. Equip us and help us to know the equipment we have so that we might change our world for Jesus' sake. Amen. You said in Ephesians 4, 7, but each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he left us with incredible giftedness. Sometimes you, you don't know. You don't, ex you don't know what it is. For me, uh-oh, she did hear me, huh? My baby. Ellis. Them little monkeys. I love them little monkeys, all of them. So, some of you, you have spiritual gifts, but you don't, you don't operate them, and you don't know that you have them. And, and, and for us to be able to do what God has told us to do, we need to operate in these gifts. He went to heaven, and, and he gave us gifts according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So God saved us, but he saved us to serve. He didn't save us to sit and sour. He saved us to serve. We're saved by grace, and we serve by grace. Anything that you do for the Lord is done by the grace of God. It's a gift from the Lord. When I get a chance to preach the gospel, there is no place in the world I'm more at home. Whether it's just talking to one-on-one -on -one with somebody or talking to a group or whatever, that's because this is what I'm supposed to do. Paul, the apostle, and I'm no Paul the apostle, but Paul said, if I don't preach, I'll die. Because that was his spiritual calling. He, he was called to preach the gospel. We all have gifts. As a child of God, you're a gifted child. All of you are. You say, well, I don't feel too gifted. You just don't know. It's, it's that you don't know. The word here it says, the word each of you refers to every child of God. God has given you a spiritual gift. The Greek word for the word grace is the word charismatic. Now, when we think of charismatic, we think, oh, those crazy, wild, charismatic people. But that's what the gift, the word grace is charismata, charismatic. And today, in your message, we'll focus on how you can discover and develop and deploy our spiritual gifts and minister to the body of Christ. That's what I believe these home groups are going to be for. So that as you go into these studies and you start getting around the things of God and the Holy Spirit begins to move, you start flowing in your giftedness. There's a lot of gifted people in here, and, and some of these I'm gonna talk about today, not about you, but about your gifts. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. God has given us a grace gift. So if we don't use that gift, it's, a, it's kind of an insult to the Lord if we don't operate in what he's given us. And he's given us this gift so that we can use it to edify the church, to build up the church, to continue to expand the church, to grow the church. In the church, you can have no inferiority, and in the church, you can have no superiority because everything we have is a gift from God. So I can't say, well, I had this, or you can't say, well, Mary, this. You can't. Anything that you have has been given to you by God. So how can you get proud or lifted up in those things? Now, sometimes I meet people who call themselves by certain names. Now I know, I believe in the fivefold ministry, but I, you know, there are people out there, well, I'm so-and-so, I'm apostle this, or I'm prophet this, and this. You know what, God is the one who gives those labels. If you're a prophet, people know it. If you're an apostle, your fruits will show it. But anything that comes, these gifts, they come from God. He's the one who says what you are and who you are in Christ Jesus. And he left us with these gifts. So we are what we are by the grace of God. 
My wife sometimes, and she's here, so I'll talk about her. But she said to me one time, you know, oftentimes, man, we hear things, and maybe we don't like the way we heard it, but if you get your butts out of the way and listen to what they said, you'll find there's wisdom in it. And one time she said to me, you know, every time you talk to somebody, do you realize you talk to them about Jesus? You're always preaching, you're always this. Now, sometimes that can be wrong. If it's not spirit led, you can push people away. And that was her fear. You could be pushing people away. You're coming on, maybe you're coming on too strong. She was doing that to protect me and also to say, you know, be, be led by the spirit. So I, I heard that and I went to the Lord and I prayed for three days. I prayed, Lord, if I'm turning people away, forgive me. If I'm doing anything that's pushing people away from you, please forgive me. And three days later, the Holy Spirit dropped this, this scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles. This is Paul speaking. And I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I was persecuted the church of God. But here's the scripture he gave me. Verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. By the grace of God, you are who you are. You can't manufacture a spiritual gift. If you have that desire for souls, that's something God gave you. So a charismatic gift, a grace gift, is a God-given gift for service and ministry, a God-given spiritual ability for service and ministry, and it goes beyond natural talent. Now, there are people who can play the guitar and sing like angels, but that's a natural gift. But then there are some that have a spiritual ability to play and sing. I mean, I've heard some people sing, and my goodness. Years ago, there was one of my favorite preachers, and uh, his name is Bernard Johnson. He's gone home to be with the Lord. But there was a man who sang for his crusades over, he was like the Billy Graham in South America. He was uh, in the Assemblies of God. And they had a man named Victorina Silva, who was a 25-year-old Brazilian man who had the most beautiful voice. They say this guy could sing, and he's 25 years old. I mean, he sang in all the big soccer games. He sang for the president. He, I mean, this guy was nationally known as this wonderful singer. Well, Victorino Silva got tuberculosis and he was in, a, it's a socialist country and he was brought into this terrible hospital. He's in the hallway, not even in an examination room. And this doctor comes in, he says, I, after examination, he said, I have two things to tell you. Number one, you're never gonna sing again. He said, number two, you have six months to live. And he spun on his heels and walked out the door. And Silva just sat there, 25 years old, nationally known. Where's all the crowd now, you know? So he pulled the sheet up over his head and he just began to cry. And he said, Lord, I'm too young to die. He didn't know the Lord. And there was an old woman who used to go to the hospital. And if you, tell, if you hear Bernard Johnson tell the story, and I shouldn't tell, I can't. Bernard Johnson said, this little old woman was the ugliest old woman you ever seen in your life. That's what Bernard Johnson said. He said, but this woman's ministry was, she went to the hospitals and she would pray for people. Nobody asked her to, she didn't do it representing a church, she did it representing Jesus. That was her spiritual gift. And she was walking down the hall, she would just look to people and when she was led, she'd pray. And she'd seen this body over there with the sheet over it. She thought, oh no, someone died. And all of a sudden she saw movement. She thought, oh hallelujah, he's still alive. So she runs up to him, pulls down the sheet, puts her face right in his face. <laughs> and, and she says, mister, are you ready to die? He said, no, ma'am. He said, she said, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? She's, and he said, no, ma'am, I don't. Would you like to? Because he can heal you, he can save you. And you're like, yes, ma'am. So this woman had the ability. She was like 90. She was in her 90s like your friend. She could quote entire books of the Bible. Her mind was so sharp. So she quoted Romans chapter 7, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. And she told him, if you come to Jesus and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, heaven will be your destiny. And so she said, would you like to be, would you like to be saved? And she, he said, yes, I would. And so he gave his life to Jesus. And then she said, sir, would you believe me if I told you that the same Jesus that just saved you could also heal you? And he said, ma'am, right now I'd believe anything you tell me. <laughs> so she quoted all the scriptures she knew on the healing power of Jesus Christ. And she prayed for him to be healed. And she, after she prayed this prayer, she said, be healed in Jesus' name. And he got up that day, got dressed, walked out of the hospital. 
saved, healed, and he connected with Bernard Johnson's ministries. Now that guy could always sing, but not like he could after he got saved. We get natural gifts when we're born, but you get spiritual gifts when you're born again. Bernard Johnson said when this guy sang at his crusades, people got out of their wheelchairs. I mean, people got saved listening to this guy sing. This morning on my way to work, I was, oh, well, I guess I'm at work, his work. I was listening to Elvis gospel. Elvis Presley could sing gospel music, people. I mean, do you know all the music he did, the only music he ever got any Grammys for was his gospel music? Nobody sang gospel music like Elvis. And I was just listening to that. I mean, man. So I want you to know you have gifts. Supernatural gifts. When you come to Jesus, God gives you gifts. So talent is natural. Spiritual gifts are supernatural. There are supernatural source. There's supernatural nature. There's supernatural in purpose. You do not choose your spiritual gift. You can't say, well, I want to be a preacher. Because if you ain't a preacher, you ain't a preacher. Well, I want to lead the singing. If you're not a, a, a worship leader, you're not a worship leader. But what can you do? What has God given you to do? That's what these Bible studies are going to be good for, to find out what it is that you are good at. I know we went through a class one time. It was a spiritual gifted class. I just don't know if I put a lot of stock in that too much. But I know that if you read your Bible, seek God's face, he will show you what your gifts are. And then when you begin to operate in those gifts, you'll be as happy as you're ever at. There's no place I'd rather be than right here, right now, talking to you guys. I think if, they, well, when the pandemic was going on, there'd be 10 people here, Roger, be here, and some of these folks, I, I'm preaching just like I do now. And there were people watching online. Marla told me the other day, she'd been sharing the gospel with this guy up in Ohio, is he? Cleveland. Cleveland. And she said, well, he said that he listens to you, and I... <laughs> But then she said, well, is that the guy with the bare feet? And then she said, I, I knew he was listening to you. <laughs> I know I told you the story. I went and preached in a tent revival down in North Omaha, and they introduced me. And this is Steve Sheridan, ta-da. It's like on the sound of music. The family Von Trapp, ta-da. Nobody shows up. The, the Von Trapp family singers, ta-da. So this is Steve Sheridan. Everybody here. Then I kicked my shoes off. And this woman in the back go, oh, it's the barefoot preacher. <laughs> uh, true story, remember Jim? She didn't know me from Adam, they knew my feet, so. <laughs> Amanda, she's a good artist. And years ago she went on a trip to Mexico and she asked to take a picture of my hand because when they got to this church in Mexico, she drew this beautiful picture of this hand over the baptistry with water coming out of it. So it, it was really pretty. And so I said, if I ever go preach in that church, I won't say those are my hands. I'll just walk around like this. And maybe you saw it say, hey, I know that hand. But that's another, all right. Ephesians chapter four, eight through 10. Wherefore the Lord says, listen here. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is, but, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth that he descended is the same also as that he ascended up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. The Lord Jesus descended to earth, lived a perfect life, suffered and bled, died on the cross, was buried and rose again. And when Jesus died on the cross for us, he purchased our salvation with his blood and at the same time he defeated Satan. Amen. Listen to this. Satan's kingdom was crushed by Calvary. Think about that. The kingdom of darkness, all his power was crushed when Jesus died on the cross on Calvary because sin was taken care of. Death no longer has sting for those who trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. As a believer, you're not afraid to die anymore because the sting is gone. Fear is gone. Most people are afraid to die. But when you're a believer and you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not afraid to die. That's right, sis. Just the next step. By his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the Lord Jesus led captivity captive. Satan had taken the world captive, but Jesus took Satan captive. Hallelujah. Put him in a figure four. And that old devil's been tapping ever since. You and that man guys know what I'm talking about. In this passage, Paul is talking about triumph, Roman triumph in those days. If you were a Roman general and you defeated an enemy, 
When you got back to Rome, what they would do is you'd be on a march, you'd be the general on a white horse running you, and all your commanders would be alongside of you, and then behind you would be the, the conquered king, generals, and they'd be stripped naked, and they would cheer the, the conquering general, and they'd make fun of the people that were conquered. And then after them would come all the spoils of war. And what they would do with the spoils of war, they give them to the Roman people. Well, Jesus conquered Satan. And he's given us all these gifts, but we don't operate in them. He's given us all the tools we need to win this battle here on earth. Every battle. The war is over. Jesus won the war, but the battles are going on. And we lose way too many battles because we're not equipped. We're not moving in the spirit of God. We need to do this. The Lord Jesus ascended on high. Now listen to these scriptures. The, the gifts described. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Or excuse me. Chapter 12, 4 through 7. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. God works in different ways, and it is the same God who does all the work in us. The spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. Now that's a New Living Translation, but that's why we get gifts. We get gifts to help each other, to build up the church, not to say, hey, look what I got. It's to be edifying to the church. It's the Holy Spirit who gives different gifts. God has given us spiritual gifts not for your enjoyment, but for your employment. He's given you spiritual gifts so that you will employ them, that you will use them for the glory of Jesus Christ. And so many of us are not doing that. I want to be used by the Lord. I want to do these things. Let me give you some of these gifts. Gift of wisdom. It says 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, to one person get, uh, the Spirit gives the gift of wisdom. To another person the Spirit gives the message of knowledge. Wisdom is a supernatural insight into the mind of God. Knowledge is knowing things that nobody can know except God gave it to you. And I know I've told you some stories of situations where I've had where I've just known things about people. No way I could have known it. It was a gift. And it was to tell that person. And when I said, like this lady I was talking to, I told her. She said, how do you know that? I said, there's no way I could know that. This is just letting you know that Jesus is in your business. And he knows your life. He knows what you're going through. That's what the gifts are for, to bring people to the Lord. This is, and, and wisdom and knowledge gifts are not common sense. It's uncommon sense. It's supernatural. I've seen it. If you've ever operated in it, it's amazing. You just know it. Bam. You just know things about people. I love it. And it was for his glory, not for people to say, well, watch out for so-and-so. You can read your mail. No, it's for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. Gifts of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the same spirit gives great faith to another. To someone else, he gives the spirit, gives the gift of healing. All believers have faith. You wouldn't be a believer if you didn't have faith. We can't be saved without faith. But some people, through the supernatural gift of faith, it's mountain-moving faith, it's heaven-shaking faith. Some people have the gift of faith. And when they pray, God moves. Not everybody has it. I know people who say, man, I sure wish I had that gift. Don't worry about that gift. What's your gift? Maybe I, you know, whatever God gives you, that's what you're supposed to have. Because if you want my gift, you're saying to God, I didn't like that gift you gave me. I wouldn't do that. Because no one is any more or less important in the eyes of God. Right? The car doesn't drive if the ignition doesn't work. Or if I can get the ignition to work and there's no tires on the car, I'm not going too far. Every part has to operate in the giftings that God has given us for us to do what we're supposed to do. Gifts of healing. In the Greek, it's actually, he says that it's a plural word, gifts of healing. And there are healings both of physical, body, soul, and mind. Physical, psychological, and spiritual healing. And there's power to heal. That's why I want to see this little boy that we were talking about. 
Now, maybe he does have a physical or a psychological problem, but he might have a spiritual problem. Let's, let's look at everything and see what we could do for him. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another person the ability to prophesy. He gives, uh, he gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. And still another person, he's given the ability to speak unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is said. The age of miracles is not past. The Bible tells us in first, uh, what is it? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchangeable. That's the thing about God. He's unchangeable. He can't change. He doesn't have to change. He's perfect. He's unchangeable, though. So God's love is, it, 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 God loves us. He loves us. Now, the hourglass is turning, though, when the, when the dispensation of grace is going to turn, when grace is going to be gone, and when grace is over, then comes wrath. That doesn't mean he changed. That just means he's on schedule. We must always remember, however, that Satan has miraculous powers too. Now there are people out there doing things and saying God did it, but God didn't do it. The enemy did it. The enemy has power. Nothing compared to the power of God though. But he'll try to fool people. There was something going on, I won't mention any names, but I had a number of people say, hey, you gotta get online and check out this revival that's going on down in Florida. So, you know me, I love revival. So I got online, it took me about all of one minute and 10 seconds to say, this isn't God. There's something wrong here. In my spirit, I knew something was dark. Sure enough, about a month later, I found out there was all kinds of monkey shine going on and Satan was being glorified, not Jesus. You gotta be careful, people. You know where that is? You know what that gift is? Discernment. How to know the difference between what's of God and what is not of God. That's a spiritual gift. Gift of prophecy. The word prophecy means the ability to foretell and tell forth. Primarily, not to foretell the future, but to tell forth the will of God in a particular matter. A prophet is not a, a what do you call these, uh, psychics. That kind of stuff comes from the devil. Most of them are phonies. But prophet, they hear from God, and they declare the things of God. And actually, New Testament, New Testament prophet is one who can declare the word of God in such a way that anybody can understand it, even the children. But it's for the edification of the church. He speaks about speaking in different languages. That he's speaking of, on the day of Pentecost, there were peoples from... Ethiopia, all over the world, in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden the apostles were praising God, and these people from all these different places were hearing these apostles who never had learned these languages praising God in these languages. That was supernatural. That's what the original he speaks of. Now, there's a prayer language, but I think sometimes in a prayer language, in church, the Bible says, in church, when there's a tongue come forward, there should be an interpretation in church. That's the biblical way it should happen. I've been in churches and seen it happen before. It's powerful too. Sometimes people go off like a motorboat. Okay, where's the interpretation? No interpretation? Okay, hold your tongue. Seriously. But you don't, our brothers and sisters who are raised in the charismatic youth movement or Pentecostals or whatever, Man, they're shouting hallelujah, you speaking all these tongues, but I'm looking for an interpretation because biblically that's what's supposed to happen. Amen. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I've seen them in operation, but don't, take it, don't use them falsely. Use it for the glory of God. How is anybody edified? Now, I remember John G. Lake, a man of God. He was over in South, America, or South Africa, and the Holy Spirit hit this woman at a prayer thing that was going on there, she stood in one spot for three days speaking a language nobody had any idea. She didn't move for three days. She kept saying whatever it was she was saying. On the third day, this person showed up 
from China. And you know, the Chinese don't just have one language, they got certain dialects. This woman was talking this guy's language and he interpreted it. Now that was a supernatural gift of God. God is awesome. He can do anything. He's given us these gifts. Interpretation, the ability to speak. Gifts, now here's something I wanna to talk to you about. Okay, those are supernatural gifts. But there's also gifts of ministry. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. If it is a gift of prophesying, then prophesy according to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. Love in action. Ministry is acts of service. It includes the general work. Gail, I'm going to pick on you. Gail has a tremendous gift of the Spirit to include people and to make people feel welcome. I watched her at the praise thing the other night, and I'm gonna pick on Norma. Norma was sitting over here, and I saw Norma, I sat with her a little bit, then I come up, next thing I know, Gail's got her over here, got her on, I said, there's Gail. <laughs> Gail, Gail befriended my wife and, and Luann, and that's her gift. She flows in that, I, I, she hates that I'm saying this, because I'd hate it if she was saying it about me. But it is a gift, it's a spiritual gift. She can get people involved. That's something else. I thank God for you, Gail, I really do. It's been a blessing to this church. And look what you've done with him. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Couldn't resist. Me too, brother. Did I ever tell you guys about my smart wife? Now, women are smarter than guys, I admit it. Guys, sorry. <laughs> They're smart. One time years ago, I think she was talking to my sister-in-law, as a matter of fact. So back in the days when I was partying, doing stupid things, before we got married, actually, I came home, I would come home, and I'd get a little buzz going, and she would wait for me to get nice and comfortable and then all of a sudden, she picked that up, bop, 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 and she said, so I heard her talking to my sister-in-law, I'm pretty sure, she said, I trained Steve. I would wait till he came home and got comfortable, then I'd go get him, and I'd, and now he picks up her stuff. I do. I'm way better than I was when I was in my father's house, my mother's house. She trained me, and the women trained men, that's for sure. And I thank her for that. There's gifts of mercy, Romans chapter 12, verse eight. We're getting close. Those with the gift of mercies are the ones who do hospital visits, like my brother Jim, or else benevolence. You know, my, Jim goes to the nursing home, he's been doing it for 25 years, and he visits people that nobody goes to see. Even a lot of these people's families don't go to see him. That's a spiritual gift. I've gone and watched him. I can't do that. I, I can't touch those people like Jim does. There's a way he, he just has a way. It's his spiritual gift. I love, I love to watch him in operation. I wish I could do it more often. That's his gift. So, now gifts are developed. Let me jump down here real quick. I believe in the five-fold ministries. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, So Christ himself gave apostles, then prophets, then evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That's what spiritual gifts are for. So that the body of Christ could be built up. We should be a powerful entity. No weapon formed against the church should prosper. There's nothing in all hell or earth can stand against a body of believers who stand boldly in Christ Jesus. Nothing. But what can they do? Kill you? <laughs> you kill me, I go be with Jesus. What are you going to take from me? Right? You got that right, sis. So you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. You know, in the Greek, pastors and teachers are similar words. But pastor's job is to guide and feed the flock. The teacher's job is to teach the flock. People call me Pastor Steve. I, I, I think I'm more of an evangelist, but whatever you want to call me, you can call me Steve. But I just got to tell people about Jesus. That's my heart. And I do love you, and I pray for you. 
but I think you'd do well to find somebody who's probably a better shepherd. But I just love to tell people about the Lord. I want you to know the Lord. God has a ministry for us to do, and you're all included in it. We need these spiritual gifts. We need these spiritual gifts. I'm praying that you find these gifts in these Bible studies. I pray that the leaders have discernment to be able to help you find your gifts. To realize that they're not just there to sit in your couch and to hear about Jesus. They're there to get equipped. They're there to get plugged in so that we can build up this body of believers. Yesterday I was on a prayer. We do a quarterly prayer call with a group of really important people in the city who are praying for our city. And there's a lot of things to be praying about. But when they came to me, they said, what, have you been, what are you praying about? I said, well, we always, we've been praying for revival for years down here, and we're praying that God would break our hearts for the sin in the church. We're praying that God would, would give us a spirit of repentance in the, in the pulpits all over this city, that we would fall on our faces again and ask God to forgive us for the terrible way we've been acting for the way the church has been presenting herself. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. That's what I pray for. I pray that. But that's all part of becoming mature in Christ, and that's what these Bible studies are all about. So let me summarize. Let me close. If you're part of the body of Christ, God bless you. If you're part of the body of Christ, then you're a gifted child. You have a gift by, given to you by God, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Find out what God wants you to do and get busy doing it. Have you ever asked the Lord, why am I here? What am I here for? Why am I alive? Why am I alive? Years ago, there was a man who had a, a nephew that he was raising because his parents were killed. This was years ago. But I read about it and it touched my heart. And this young man, when his, his uncle was a preacher, and one day he... Uncle wasn't in his office, but he saw a place in the scripture where it said, for this reason I was born. And this kid thought, why was I born? Was I born to be an orphan? Was I born so that my, I'd have to go through my parents' death and be different than everybody else? Why was I born? He didn't know why he was born. So he left the house and he was feeling down as 15 years old, walking along, and all of a sudden he heard the whistle of sirens coming and he looked down the street, there was a, a theater, a movie theater, and the matinee was going on, the Iroquois Theater, and the theater was on fire, and there were all these little kids in there watching movies. That 15-year-old boy went in, and he pulled out 20-some kids, got them all out. And by the time he got out, he was so filled with smoke that he collapsed. And they took him to the hospital and nobody knew who he was. He didn't have ID. 15 year olds in those days didn't have cell phones, iPhones, and all this stuff. But fortunately, a nurse came in and looked and she said, that's my pastor's nephew. So she called the pastor. And when he woke up, he was really, really bad. But he told his uncle, now I know why I was born. I was born to be here so that I could get those kids out of that theater. Not one of the children died, but he did. He died, but that's why he was born. Why were you born? Why are you here? Our problem is, is we're always going, what's in it for me, what's in it for me? No, God, what do you want me to do? No, I'm your servant. What do you want to do with this life? When you serve the Lord, it brings joy. You must be saved by grace before you can serve by grace. You need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never truly been saved, then you can be saved today. And I'm going to give you some scriptures. I want you to pray today that you ask Jesus to come into your heart. Because when you do that, your life will never be the same. And when you really ask Jesus into your heart, he's going to give you gifts. They might not manifest themselves right away, but just watch and see. Watch and see what happens. Call upon Jesus today. Repent and turn away from your sins. Turn to Christ and ask him to forgive you and acknowledge him as the Lord of your life. Listen, Romans chapter 3, 23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. 
If all have sinned, that means all need a Savior. We all need Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you might be 10, you might be 20, you might be 80, you need the Lord. You need him today. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. Hallelujah. And John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can come to Jesus today. Uh-oh. Bring, bring me that baby. You can give your life today. Today you can say, Jesus, come into my heart, and he's going to come. You can surrender your life to the Lord. Say, forgive me for all that I've done. I'm so sorry. That's all he's asking for. The Bible says, a broken and a contrite spirit or heart I will not despise. When you come to the end of yourself, that's where you meet God. When you come to the end of the road, that's where you find God. So today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't know these gifts because you don't know Jesus. I'm inviting you today to come to Jesus. Just do the communion. We'll go ahead and do this like this. If you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, today I'm inviting you to come and give Jesus your life. Give him your life. What do you got left? Say, man, I don't like, I don't like not being in control. Let me ask you a question. How is control worked for you so far? With you running the show, how's that going? Not very good. I thank God. I have been blessed ever since I gave my life to Jesus Christ. There's no question about it. I've been blessed. The other day I was counting my blessings. Blessed by my wife. Blessed by my children. Blessed by my grandchildren, my great-grandson. I'm blessed by my in-laws. I had great in-laws. I'm blessed. Family, friends, I'm rich but I don't have a lot of dollars, yeah. but I'm rich in the Lord, and it's all because of Jesus. You know why? Jesus, he shares the wealth. You want some of that? Who wants some of that? If you wanna know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to come down here, I wanna pray for you. I want you to come down here, let me pray for you. I don't wanna embarrass you, I don't really care if I do, to be honest with you. I, I don't care about that. You know, they hung Jesus on the cross naked for all the world to ridicule and make fun of. But he gave, but it didn't, it didn't stop him from dying on the cross. And I want you to come to Jesus. You don't care who, who knows about it. Come to Jesus and give him your heart and give him your life. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The word of God says today when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden yourself. Well, I think I'm saved. If you don't know you're saved, come on. If you don't know that you're saved, come down here and meet Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and give him your heart and give him your life. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with you. You're just as precious as you want to be, sis. He loves you. He loves you so much. Some of you guys have been faking and breaking for a long time. You know how to say the right things at the right time, but your heart is not right with God. And you can fool me every time, but you never fool him. Guys, the day is going to come when we're going to die and we're going to stand before the Lord. And whether we go to heaven or hell is totally dependent on whether or not we really surrendered our life to Jesus Christ and we gave him our life. What are you waiting on? Here, he says, here's eternal life. Here's eternal life. And I paid for it, Jesus said. I paid for it with my blood because I love you. And if you were the only person left in this world that needed to be saved, I'd come back and do it for you, Horace. That's what Jesus is saying. If you were the last person on the earth and you still needed to be saved, I'd come and do it alone for you, Bruce. That's what Jesus is saying. I'd die for you. 
And that's what he did for all of us. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. My brothers and sisters, let me pray for you. You've already stepped forward in faith. But you've already said, Lord, here I am. Save me. Save me, Jesus. Lord Jesus, save my brothers and my sisters. Thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary for their sins, for my sins, and for the sins of all the world. I pray, Lord, that heaven would move over them and that you would overwhelm them with your grace and with your glory, with your forgiveness. Forgive every sin of theirs. Forgive every sin. Hold no charge against them. Wash them in the blood that was shed on Calvary. Give them a new heart and a new mind. Help them not only to be forgiven by you, but to forgive themselves and to forgive others just as you forgave us. Lord Jesus, fill us with the Holy Spirit and lead them to the path, but guide them, Holy Spirit, on the right path. Lord, give them gifts and let them use these gifts for the glory of God the Father, God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. I ask these things and believe them totally because he said so. I declare by faith you're saved because the Bible says so. Would you all please repeat after me? I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. And some of you guys, I want you to come to the Bible study for the New Believers class tomorrow. Herb and Israel and Kathy are going to start building on the foundation that the Lord laid here today. Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you. Now, hallelujah. Amen. Before, before anybody goes anywhere, we're going to have communion. And so I'd like you to stay. You guys are welcome to the table of communion now, too. Because he died on the cross for your sins. And when we have communion, we remember the broken body and the shed blood for our sins. So come to communion. We'll go ahead and clear and let the communion people get set and come to communion. Matt's going to sing a song for us, John.